Good morning and welcome to Bazaar Morning Call. I'm Anuj with me, Prashant and Sonia. Uh, of course, uh, Ganpati time and uh, the market needs some divine intervention perhaps uh, and uh, might be timely for, for, for all you know and uh, you know, for, for all of you celebrating uh, Happy Ganesh Chaturthi. Uh, after two years, we, yes. we are having this. Right? And uh, Ganpati is known, the god is known to be a remover of obstacles, right? Mm. So hope for them, at least from a market standpoint, all the obstacles are removed. I mean, I love this uh, time of the year. I mean, the markets yeah. are full. It's just uh -huh. complete festive cheer. Uh, I mean, just that traffic is a bit of a problem. Traffic, I mean, you navigate. It's always a problem, that's, right? That, that's okay. That you, can, you can take it, right? Uh, By the way, did you guys notice that all of us are in almost the same, same in the same color so tone, huh? color tone, tone. purple it's a purple tie purple, purple dress better for wine <laughs> wine tone yes <laughs> but let's put some let's put some basic cues on table uh, the big sort of hope that the market would have is that uh, we have some kind of decoupling. Uh, I mean, you know, sometimes I feel I'm going back to 2003 and 4 because that's all that I heard at, uh, you know, during those years. Uh, that is this decoupling. Uh, what is decoupling? The U.S. market has been extremely weak, but our market has been extremely strong. The U.S. market is closing at the lows of the day. For last three days in a row, the U.S. market closed at lows. Our market, on the other hand, even on days when we have gap downs or on days we have gap ups, is closing at highs of the day. The only problem, perhaps, is the dollar index, which is stubbornly close to its highs. Let's see if that retreats a bit. The market also has to react to the weak GDP print uh, and this weekly expiry as well. The SGX Nifty, all told, is telling you that you'll have a gap down. Futures closing was 827, 17,827. We are starting at 17,461. If the SGX Nifty is right, that is. Uh, let's see how things move. Uh, Sonia. So, you know, as you rightly said, I mean, what's happening across the globe is a totally different picture from what's happening in India, right? So, for now, I 350 points down on the SGX Nifty, and uh, that's purely because of what happened in the US markets, not just yesterday, but uh, through the month of August. So the Dow was down about 280 points on Wednesday. It's been four straight days of losses in the US markets. And, uh, you know, other asset classes are falling as well on the back of recession fears. So Brent is now, was down about 2% overnight. It's back close to $95 a barrel. And here's the print for the month of August. So just look at it. Dow is down over 4%, S&P 500 4.2% and, 4 and NASDAQ 4.6%. So the big question that I'm asking is, will the US markets challenge the June lows? It's a totally different picture for our own markets, right? I mean, there was big buying that you saw from foreign investors the uh, day before yesterday, about 4,165 crores. And this 20 DMA of 17,570 is something that the Nifty is holding. So given take everything, Anuj, do you think that this decoupling theory is actually going to work where whatever happens in the U.S. markets, our markets stay resilient? No, obviously, if the U.S. market has to collapse, uh, then, uh, you know, our market will also have to take that into account. But, Sonia, for starters, I refuse to believe that we will start at what the SGX Nifty is telling us. Uh, and I see no reason why we should be doing that. Yes, we've had two back-to-back -back bad days in the U.S., but the, our, our market, you know, the kind of strength that you've seen over the last couple of days, I don't think we open at 17,461. I mean, we might get there after a bit, but I don't think we start there. And, uh, you know, that's why I, I believe that index trading, trading should be available to, to everyone, uh, you know, on days like today. But, uh, the U.S. market is weak. Make no uh, mistake about that. But therein lies the answer to your question. Uh, the U.S. markets, all indices are trading below their major moving averages. In India, the Nifty on Tuesday closed above the 10, 20, 50 and 200 day moving average. So my sense is, and with this FI buying, the FI buying, by the way, is highest for the year. 4,165 crores is highest for 2022. In the near term, you follow what big money is doing. I and mean, if, if you buy 4,000 crores at, uh, you know, 17,700, I mean, if you get 17,400, you would buy. That is my sense. So I think the basic, the first impulse should be to buy the dip. Whether that works out or not, the risk-reward trade would be that. There, there are key zones uh, that, you know, you should look at. Uh, and it has worked out till now, right? I mean... If, when you see a dip, now the automatic reaction is let's go and buy it because it's worked for the Absolutely. last Absolutely. You know, that's something that's worked. You know, you see if that works, it works out well. And again, this is the zone, right? The Nifty Monday and Tuesday low, 17,166 to 17,401. And Nifty Bank, 37,942 to 38,472. What I'm trying to say here is that if you open in this zone or somewhere around this zone, say 17,450, 460, risk reward wise, it doesn't make any sense to sell at 17,400. It would be very risky given the market's recent momentum. The 20-day exponential moving average is also placed at 17,425, which is something that the market's respected on closing basis. And today being the weekly expiry, my sense is that there could be recovery. I mean, if there's a recovery, 
that recovery has to be led by domestic stocks, bank nifty, autos, something which has been doing well, something which has been outperforming the export oriented stocks like IT and pharma. So that should be the approach. I mean, if the market breaks the first hour low, then that theory is nullified. But given the recent market momentum and given the price action, my sense is that's how it might play out. Uh, but uh, uh, Prashant, uh, what do you have for us? I mean, uh, outperformance is what I have, <laughs> the market has, right? You know, I am still amazed at what we saw on Tuesday. Yeah. Uh, I would really like someone to explain uh, to me, I mean, where what did we see? From? Where it came I mean, it was a bold out of the blue, right? And uh, 4,000 crores uh, was uh, the FI buying number, uh, and that's the market. I mean, uh, it's all-time high monthly closing highs, absolutely trending, clean day, no doubts, no hesitation, no look back at all. Where does it leave us, though, is this, and the graphics will come up on your screen. Since Jackson Hole, uh, which is where the last time the Fed chair sounded very hawkish, these are the changes. The S&P 500 is down almost 6%. The Nifty is up 1%. These are in local currency terms. But, I mean, the exchange rate has not collapsed or moved in any large significant way, so minor variations because of that. 6%, so it's near 7% outperformance in four days flat uh, for uh, India as compared to what the... US. So the world is going one way, the India is going another. Uh, can that continue? Just a couple of points. Tuesday's move was unusually large and forceful. It was also unusual, I would say. You know, the, it's always true, and you can go back the last decade and a half, FII's, uh, foreign investors are essentially, they move markets, right? Uh, they bat on the front foot. Uh, they are incremental price setters because they buy in an aggressive fashion. I mean, the tone tenor of how they uh, go in, uh, you can see it on the screen. But to see a day like, you know, Tuesday, given what is going on, I mean, it's, it's kind of tough to imagine a global uh, fund, even if there is some allocation which is coming in uh, or some, somebody had to allocate before the end of the month here. It could be, you know, n number of reasons, but it was really large. Whatever be the uh, color of the money, etc., it's heartening to see that we actually had large cash FII number. I mean, you know, if it was a very small, piddly little FII number and the market was up, uh, you know, whatever, 3%, uh, that would give you uh, some jitters. Uh, so that's that's the Tuesday session, right? I mean, but that's where we pick off, so that's important. Banks seem to be in a good place, although they have done well. But July credit growth is 15%. Non-food credit growth is 15%. That's strong. It's stronger than even June. Uh, Indian market returns are and have been for a while the top of the chart so far in 2022. Number one rank amongst large markets. Uh, that also means that e, uh, India, MSCI India... Uh, last trailing 12 month uh, price to earnings multiple is at over a hundred percent premium to other emerging market valuations so you know it's it's uh, it's quite something again uh, will there be mean reversion usually there is at some point it needs some kind of a catalyst one doesn't know but over a hundred percent premium is where we are at and uh, there is some sobering news and we'll have Lata join us in a bit from now Economists, sell-side economists have cut F523 GDP growth estimates to about 7 odd percent, 7 percent or lower, which still puts India relatively in a pretty good stead. But in absolute sense, there is some come down, some drop off, which has happened after the GDP numbers yesterday. Uh, from the global context, what's ahead? You got the U.S. jobs data tomorrow. Uh, that, of course, is important for Fed pr pricing. And uh, in the, in U eurozone, from 25 base, from no hike, no hike to 25 to 50. Now, the consensus, by and large, is at about 75 basis points hike from the ECB come next week. So that's the global setup uh, in terms of uh, where we are as we begin another session. Sonia. Oh, absolutely. I mean, uh, you know, this market has outperformed uh, global markets quite a bit, actually, yeah. over the last many months. So perhaps today uh, could be no different. But I'm also watching out for the auto stocks because the numbers for the month of August come out today. And, you know, I was just reading uh, the order backlog from automakers mm -hmm. is now at a record high. There are six and a half lakh cars that are waiting to be delivered mm -hmm. and the waiting period is really high. So that just shows you the kind of demand, right? The trends are healthy, especially in passenger vehicles and in commercial vehicles. And the growth rates are looking quite good. I mean, passenger vehicles expected to grow 30 percent, MHCVs almost 50 percent. And just two stocks that I want to talk about, Maruti and m, m, m because of the auto uh, piece. 85% growth for m, m Autos is what we're expecting to see in this month. So it's going to be a good one this and time you know, In the last three months, just look at what m, &M has done and what Maruti's yeah. in the last six months. And that reiterates the theory that you buy good stocks in bear markets because you never know when the trend would turn. Uh, and uh, the, the market would always move ahead of the data. The data is just showing us what the market did. 
three mm. months back or six months back, which is make a bottom and then just move on. Both Maruti, M&M, &M, Hero Moto, TVS, and they are up 40 to 50 percent in last four or five months. Uh, from the 52-week lows. It's phenomenal. You know, the XUV 700 m and has the longest waiting period in India. Now, the waiting period has reached two years, Anuj. Wow. If you book an XUV 700 now, you in all likelihood, you won't get it for the next two years. Okay. I mean, first of all, I won't book it. Uh, if, I, if I book it, I'll take your help, maybe, Sonia. Maybe, you know, you'll put some... and, and, and what if you want a specific colour? In <laughs> three years. Then, <laughs> endless, then endless. But in any case, I mean, that's the big data point to watch out for today. But uh, let's tell you what is lined up for you. First up, we have some opinion coming in from Victor Schwetz of McQuarrie, who says that despite daily hawkishness thus far, there has been not much tightening. He says they are not yet at neutral and investors are backing a moderate recession. McQuarrie expects that volumes will rise as we breach neutral, but disorderly derating is not on the cards. Okay, and on the bonds, we have Dhawal Dalal of Edelweiss who says that bond yields have declined in anticipation of index inclusion while glo global bond yields have uh, diverged with 10-year bond yield at 7.2% is closer to the fair value assuming terminal repo rate at 6% and heavy government borrowing. Uh, to continue, he expects the 10-year to trade in the range of 7.12 to 7.27 uh, in the near term. All right, Suresh Tanti, a senior investment strategist at Credit Suisse, he's joining us right now to take some questions uh, and get us ready from a global perspective. How are things looking? Suresh, good to have you with us here. Thank you very much. You know, uh, the world's going one way and India is going another. I'm talking about markets. Uh, will there be, uh, you know, mean reversion at some point? Do you think this is likely to continue? When, if you have a specific comment on what we saw here in India uh, on uh, Tuesday, the last session yesterday was a holiday market, local market holiday. And a huge move up, led by very strong inflows. Yeah, I think at some point of time, we are going to see conversions. But right now, um, the issue is that uh, the global growth is slowing down. When the global uh, economy is struggling to grow even by 1% or 2%, um, Indian economy last quarter grew by 13% plus. And this financial year, it's expected to grow by 7%. So everybody is looking for growth, and I think uh, India is one place which is offering growth right now, and that's why we are seeing this divergence playing out in the equity market. But eventually, I think it will converge as um, the higher interest rate in uh, India also weigh on the valuation of the equity market. Um, you highlighted earlier that uh, Indian equity market is now trading at 100% premium to some of the other markets. So valuations are definitely expensive compared to the rest of the world. Mm. Okay. Suresh, hi. Uh, good morning. But uh, let's, you know, for, for, for a moment, just talk about the mother market. In the US, uh, uh, do you get a, se a sense that uh, we have sort of resumed that bear market and would break the yearly lows? Um, definitely, I think we'll see more downside. Mm. And what we have done from our side is we have turned underweight on equities day before yesterday. So basically, we see more downside playing out in the global equity market, specifically the US market. Um, I think what we saw in the month of July and the first half of August was the uh, typical bear rally, uh, and that rally is over. Um, the growth is slowing down, and we are seeing cost of capital has gone up. So at, at this point of time, U.S. bonds look more attractive compared to the equity market, and we are going to see more outflows from uh, U.S. equities. So I won't be surprised to see if we see 5 to 10% kind of correction in the next uh, few months and quarters. Okay. Uh, I think the big question from an Indian market standpoint, Suresh, is that will this outperformance continue uh, compared to global peers? You know, something that even Prashant was discussing earlier. Uh, in that context, if it does, where are the pockets of growth, you think? Because there's been a big move that we've seen in, say, consumption stocks, in banking names, in autos. Uh, this whole theme is playing out very well. Your views here? Um, I would still suggest to focus on the domestic um, economy. Um, those would be, once again, banks and FMCG stocks. Um, although banks have done extremely well, but they are not expensive compared to the rest of the market. And the credit growth is still very strong, around 15%. So I think banks, banks would be the place to be to play on the domestic recovery. Um, the other parts of the market, I think they could remain under pressure, some, something like tech stocks, uh, because global economy is going to slow down. And that would mean um, MNCs could curtail their IT spending. So I won't be so bullish on the Indian uh, tech names. Would not be so bullish on Indian uh, tech names. Uh, <clears throat> Suresh, uh, you know, 
if uh, how, how likely is it that uh, as you said it very likely we see meaningful downsides in the us right more downside from uh, from here uh, will does that necessarily drag uh, the rest of the world lower but the problem uh, to be fair is not just the us right very large chunky blocks are slowing down there is of course the us europe is uh, has been in a mess of its own for a while and there is china also which is meaningfully slowing down uh, the property market dragging things da down significantly uh, so i mean you can make the argument that uh, you know investors at the end of the day want growth and this is still a market which is seeing uh, relatively much stronger growth much stronger growth uh, but you also have to pay top dollar for it is it yes absolutely so this story has played out so far india has been extremely well compared to the rest of the world because of the superior growth story but at some point of time i think a valuation will cap the upside um indian equity market still up year to date when rest of the world is down 15 to 20% i think as uh, the global equity markets go down further from current levels you will see some more downside in the indian equity market and and similar to us i won't be surprised to see the interest rate story playing out in india as rates go higher growth might eventually slow down and equity might look more expensive compared to the bond market so i won't be surprised to see some downside in the indian equities uh, <clears throat> suresh uh, we started to see quite a bit of inflow into indian market after a very aggressive outflows from the foreign investors uh, uh, but uh, the the worry perhaps is uh, is this sort of hot money chasing uh, sort of momentum or is this some genuine shift happening from say market like china and couple of other commodity markets uh, into india what would be your view i think it's most likely the fast money or hot money which was basically looking for technical opportunity as uh, the commodity prices came down especially oil i think investors were looking for um, oil importers and india and indonesia stand out within asia on that front um, but eventually as uh, the global markets go down um, i would be really surprised if uh, that hot money stays in india i don't think you are going to see um, any substantial amount of foreign inflows when the global growth is uh, going to slow down uh, most likely investors will stay back home which would be the us market or if the, the japanese investors stay in japan not looking out into the emerging markets but so far these have just been fears right for many months now i mean everyone's talking about re a recessionary fear but nothing has played out i mean the labor market is still very strong most of the you know the personal consumption spending data in the us has been very robust as well so if it doesn't play out in its entirety do you think then india will receive a major share of the money that comes through i think the growth is going to slow down because if it doesn't slow down that would mean fed will just continue to hike policy rate um right now the expectation is that uh, the terminal rate would be somewhere around 4% and even after achieving 4% growth does not slow down inflation does not come come down then fed will have to hike policy rate more aggressively and that would mean dollar would be stronger and ina could be weaker and that could lead to outflows from the indian equity market so irrespective of the recession or not i think the focus is more on the inflation picture if inflation doesn't come down then fed will have to hike rates more aggressively and that would mean uh, there will be more outflows from uh, india All right, we'll leave it at that. Thanks a lot for uh, joining in and uh, giving us an update on the global markets and how you're approaching it. Well, let's slip into a quick break on that note. On the other side, our list of top 10 stocks is lined up. Stay tuned. डाउनलोड नाउ इन्वेस्टमेंट इन सिक्योरिटीज मार्केट सब्जेक्ट मार्केट रिस्क रीड ऑल द रिलेटेड डॉक्यूमेंट केयरफुल बिफोर इन्व
There are those who are always looking for what's next. Changing lanes, shifting modes, always in command. Sensing what lies ahead. The all-new Hyundai Tucson next drives now. Your health is our concern. Choose network or appropriate hospital. Our telemedicine and customer care team are available to guide you. Star Health Insurance, always at your doorstep. Welcome back. Well, the SGX Nifty for now is indicating a 350-point cut. Uh, it's trading at 17,474 versus the Nifty Futures Tuesday close of 17,828. So let's see if that actually shapes up. The market has been very, very strong. Uh, there's large buying from FIs as well. Uh, so let's see if the dips get bought today. But Anuj, what are the stocks you're looking at this morning? Yeah, uh, Sunny, just to just to reiterate the point I made, I think some people may have misconstrued it. Uh, uh, you know, you, you have to weigh in the risk reward. And if the market's message is that, uh, you know, lows are breaking, uh, then you're out. But otherwise, I mean, as I said, after 350 point gap down, you look for, you know, opportunity to see if the market's recovering. If there is a recovery, it has to be led by domestic stocks. So the st stronger stocks is what you focus on. Bajaj Finance, I think that's been the strongest stock in the market for some time, ever since its numbers. Uh, massive delivery buying again on uh, on Tuesday. Bajaj Finserv, again, same story. And you know, most of these stocks you will see are, are showing rising trend line, and rising 20-day moving average. Uh, Hindustan Unilever and Britannia, crude's also down. That also helps on margin. So I think these are the kind of stocks that you sort of focus on. If the market has to rally, uh, the domestic stocks, they will have to lead it and not the export oriented stocks. That's why I'm watching out for all these names. All right, uh, <clears throat> Anuj, uh, thanks very much for that. We'll keep an eye. Now, Z has got a, a bunch of news flow. Uh, important to uh, note, Mangalam is standing by with all of that. Mangalam, good morning. Good morning. So, two reasons why Z is in focus today. The first one is that, uh, you know, on uh, uh, Tuesday late evening, they announced that they've signed a licensing agreement with Disney Star to broadcast ICC events. Uh, ICC events would uh, between 2024 and 2027, which would include a couple of champions, uh, one champion trophy, a couple of T20 World Cups and the 2027 Men's World Cup itself. The deal financials have not been disclosed, but analysts do believe that the payments for this, because it's a licensing agreement, would be staggered and will not impact their bottom line as much. But importantly, it can help increase their linear TV viewership as the company did not have a significant presence in sports. So this was uh, the one missing cog. So that's a positive. However, yesterday we got a news piece coming in from Reuters saying that the CCI's initial review of Sony and Z merger has found some competition concerns. Analysts out here believe that because it's just an initial review, information exchange with the CCI is not unusual and the overall market share for the uh, market in uh, which be, both these companies operate is rather fragmented. So at best there could be just a few changes. So not really a big worry but will continue to be a bit of an overhang. Z has read, uh, written that you know the numbers mentioned by the story and Reuters have been old so the dialogue with the CCI is continuous there could be some positivity on Z on account of the uh, the deal that they've done with the IC uh, on ICC events but this could play as a counterbalancing uh, overhang on the stock too <clears throat> okay thanks a lot for that well uh, I'm watching out for ONGC and Reliance because the windfall tax on crude has been increased and uh, because of this move up and down, there's a lot of volatility as far as the windfall tax is concerned. Sometimes it's brought down, now it's been raised. So this added uncertainty on these stocks. I'm going with red over there. The tax on crude, the windfall tax on crude has been increased to 13,300 rupees per ton from 13,000 earlier. Also, the export duty on ATF has been raised, the export duty on diesel has been hiked, and the export duty on petroleum, though, remains nil as of now. But because of the rise in uh, the windfall tax, I'm going with red on these stocks. Okay, we're we'll going with red on these stocks. Let's see uh, how they move. Uh, now, Rima is covering a couple of pharma stocks this morning. Rima, hi, good morning. Hi, good morning. Let me start with Biocon, where there is negative news. The US FDA has issued 11 observations each for its two sites in Bengaluru and six observations for its Malaysian site. The US FDA inspections took place in the month of August between 11th and 30th of, this, of the month gone by. The company said the inspections were on account of three pre-approval inspections for their drugs, as well as a capacity expansion inspection for the biosimilar Tratsuzumab. 
Uh, the company says the observations primarily relate to improving strategies for microbial control, enhancing quality oversight, augmenting the use of software applications, computerized tools to aid risk assessment and other procedural and facility upgrades. The company says in uh, the exchange filing they do not expect the outcome of these inspections to impact the current supply of their products, but expect a, you know, an overhang on Biocon uh, because of the US FDA observations. Glenmark Pharma has indicated that its partner Hikma Pharma has also launched a seasonal allergic rhinitis nasal spray in the US and for Zydus Life they've received a US FDA approval to market a generic version of a tablet which is used to treat nerve damage and depression. Back okay, thanks a lot for that, uh, Reema. Well, one stock in focus has been Ashok Leyland. It's been rising for the last many days. And this morning, there is news that Ashok Leyland has bagged a mega bus order uh, from United Arab Emirates. So, uh, this is an order in the UAE for 1,400 school buses. And it's the largest ever bus order that Ashok Leyland has bagged. The total fleet deal is worth $75.1 million. And not only that, Ashok Leyland has uh, decided that they will start testing the demand for electric buses and MHCVs and LCVs in UAE as well. The company says that the bus demand has revived significantly because of the opening of schools and offices. Remember, Ashok Leyland is the market leader in MHCV buses in India and is the fourth largest bus manufacturer in the world in volume terms. Uh, the stock has already gone up about 26% in 2022 and is expensive now. It's trading at 21 times forward. Uh, but I'll keep an eye out on the stock. I'm going with green because of the big bus order that they have received. Absolutely. Uh, Sonia, SpiceJet uh, is also... Uh, got news flow, right? Yes. So, you know, SpiceJet delayed both their March and June quarter numbers mm. uh, because of the issues that were going on with the company. Uh, now, they've released both those numbers and looking very weak. The losses are piling up for SpiceJet. In Q4, there was a net loss of 485 crores, which has uh, risen substantially compared to Q4 of last year. In FY22 overall, they've seen losses of 1,721 crores. This compares to 1,000 crores of losses in FY21. And in Q1 as well, the losses continue. So they've reported losses of 784 crores. Now, apart from all the other issues that they are facing, the rise in ATF prices is the big reason for uh, the, uh, the bottom line getting hit. So in Q4, for example, ATF prices went up 105% year-on-year and 40% quarter-on-quarter. Ajay Singh of SpiceJet said that this is the most severe operating environment in the recent past. It is record high ATF prices and a depreciating rupee that were the major problems for SpiceJet. So I'm going with red uh, over there. But Vahishta is also joining in to give us some more stocks that are in the news. Vahishta, over to you. Thanks for that, Sonia. Well, GMR Group has said that they shall be divesting 30% equity stake in PTGEMS, which is engaged in coal mining in Indonesia. Now, the GMR Group is expected to receive an excess of $420 million from this deal. Now, the, the, the divestment at present is aimed at strengthening of the balance sheet through significant reduction of the corporate debt. Now, as on 30th of June 2022, the net debt stood at 7,800 crores. And the divestment shall provide an impetus to the non-airport business through the reduction of the leverage and provide a platform for the green energy initiatives. We also know that GMR uh, Group's energy businesses are currently having an installed capacity in excess of 3,000 megawatts. Moving on to Dish TV, the chairman and the non-executive director, which is Jawahar Lal Goel, has stepped down. The shareholders of Dish TV have rejected the proposal to reappoint him. And Yes Bank, which is the Dish TV's largest shareholder with nearly 25% stake, has opposed Mr. Goel's reappointment. Additionally, Yes Bank had sought the removal of five directors in total, including Mr. Goel, citing corporate government's issues in the past. Back to you. Okay, Vahishta, thanks a lot for that. So here's a quick recap of all the stocks that we're looking at. Stocks with positive news flow. There's Glenmark Pharma, Zydus Life, Ashok Leyland, ONGC Reliance Industries, GMR Power and Urban Infra and Dish TV. While stocks with negative news flow today, there's Z Entertainment, there's Biocon as well as SpiceJet. All right, uh, let's now shift focus to some important macro cues. The first quarter GDP, as we know, has come in at 13.5%, which is below market expectations of around 15%. The GVA2 came in at 12.7%, which is below the poll that CNBC TV18 threw up. Lata is here with the fine print. Lata, disappointing this time? Yes, sir. It's, you know, this 13.5% uh, comes on top of a 20% in the uh, first quarter of last year. So people will wonder why is this uh, so bad? 13 and a half over 20% looks very good. Uh, but, uh, you know, the Reserve Bank's forecast stands at 162 Now, if you 
at just 13 and a half and if the other quarters remain the same then the reserve bank will have to bring down its full year forecast from 7.2 to around 6.7 i mean just arithmetically speaking now why is 13 and a half bad when it is coming over 20% is the point i'm trying to make uh, let me take the absolute gdp number for q1 the entire gdp is 36.85 lakh crore if you compare it to q1 3 years ago pre covid that is only 3.8% higher now that is the problem because the weakness of 2020 has not been overcome despite a 13 and a half uh, that's the important point to make let me take one or two areas which are particularly bad manufacturing manufacturing gdp is at 6.05 lakh crore looks good year on year 4.8 percent higher but look at it three years ago level uh, it's you know barely seven percent higher over three years manufacturing has grown just seven percent that's bad construction that's even worse construction gdp has come at 2.62 lakh crore year on year that looks very good 16.8 percent higher but look at it from three year ago level in three years construction has grown one percent and the worst performance comes from trade hotels transport and communication that's a large sector it's the biggest entry in gdp it accounts for all the services you know the udp hotels all the msmes that one is at 5.59 lakh crore gdp looks very good 26 percent higher than last year but compared to three years ago it is 15 percent lower that's the pain in the gdp the msme let me leave you with something which is good private consumption you know consumption is doing very well uh, when you look at the titans and the other uh, you know asian pains of the world that one is at 22 lakh crore and it's 10 percent over the three-year period which is good i mean at least it is a three percent cagr not great but at least okay capital formation again at 12.8 lakh crore 20 percent year on year and about seven percent over the last three years not terrible compared to the others so clearly everybody had to lower their gdp and you've got city lowering its gdp from they were standing at eight percent now they have come down to 6.7 percent but city just notes that their personal consumption is very strong showing domestic demand is good jpm's uh, uh, gdp stands at about seven percent uh, morgan stanley at 7.2 clsa at 6.8 but i can tell you that almost everyone is below seven uh, that looks like uh, the state of gdp this okay, year that looks like state of gdp but well, Lata is passionate about the uh, economy, but uh, you know what this tells you is uh, maybe she's more passionate about Udupi restaurants, like, uh, uh -huh. <laughs> like she said. No, that's but, a large category, <laughs> and so it is very painful when that one I, does I, badly. I, I understand. <laughs> Aside from my passion, I that. despite my, uh, uh, you know. Um, my Many passion contributions. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> okay. Well, well, both of you put together must have contributed quite a bit over the years. In spite yeah. of it, fifteen percent lower. <laughs> so we better eat more. Well. I mean, though, even though I'm a North Indian, but you know, uh, I also you know can have contributed a lot. But okay, we'll take a break. Uh, on the other side of this break, uh, Aditya Suresh, uh, head of India Research and Strategy at Macquarie Group, will be joining us for some fundamental stock analysis. Also, we'll connect with Keki Mistry, Vice Chairman and CEO at HDFC, to discuss their business outlook going ahead. Welcome back. Uh, we have uh, Aditya Suresh now joining us, Head of India Research and Strategy at Macquarie. Uh, the market, of course, uh, uh, is in for a week start and then we'll take it from there. Aditya, good morning. Uh, you know, uh, you know, Prashant just highlighted the point that the uh, Indian market premium, a valuation premium over uh, MSCI is now at some kind of record high. But your thoughts on the kind of outperformance that we have seen from Indian market and whether that can continue? So good morning. Thank you for having me on the show. Um, to Prashant's point, I think the the, uh, the strength of the Indian market and the resilience has been something which has surprised us all. Uh, in terms of the uh, where, where India is trading at uh, today, we're at uh, roughly about 18 times two year forward uh, earnings estimates. And if you think about that, uh, premium versus EM or premium versus world, yes, we've always been expensive. Uh, but today we're still sitting at about plus three standard deviations above normal. Uh, so the, the valuation context uh, remains challenging, right? Uh, but I think within this entire setup, if I, if I take the same story back, say six months, six months ago, we were, we were speaking about a similar kind of valuation premium. Uh, today, however, we're feeling a bit more, um, let's say, confident in terms of where 
we're at uh, in terms of some of these risk factors. So like six months back, again, what we think about is uh, margin risk on the downside, right? whether, whether it be consumer or IT. Uh, that we actually got reflected in the numbers as well. Uh, inflation was a problem. Commodity prices was, uh, was a problem. Higher cost of capital was an uh, incremental kind of headwind. Uh, a lot of those factors have kind of uh, already kind of expressed itself. So incrementally, some of these risks are, uh, are, are maybe less relevant than what it was six months back. Uh, and some of the cuts to the base in terms of earnings is, is already in the, in the base, right? So uh, whilst the valuation backdrop is full, some of the risks which you've been speaking about, um, that's already kind of largely expressed itself. So uh, whilst we're not making a big call that, that India is going to rally, let's say 10% from where we are today, uh, we do expect a fairly range bound market. We, we are remaining bottom up and fairly selective. Uh, some of the broader aggregate risk factors that, that has kind of receded in fund flows, right? So like, um, if you, if, if you take the, the, the net foreign outflows in the nine months up till June, it's about 35 billion US dollars of outflow, right, uh, from India. And then uh, in August, we've seen, say, $6 billion worth of inflow coming in uh, on a broader EM ex China kind of inflows about $11 billion. So India's seen a fairly strong kind of bid back from a kind of EM fund flow perspective as well. So, so um, I guess the key, the key piece was that, so yes, valuations are full, but a lot of the risks are actually um, starting to get reflected. Uh, and therefore, incrementally, we're feeling less uh, bearish than what we were feeling, say, six months back. Uh, Aditya, I know it's a, uh, you know, sort of, it's just one day, uh, but my question is about one day, which is on Tuesday, the market that we saw, I'm sure that you guys were also watching in awe what was happening, right? The way the market went up. Uh, about a half a billion dollars worth of cash buying happened, uh, as data tells us. Uh, any uh, sense of what, what that was about? I mean, I'm sure you guys would have discussed it internally. Did you see flows of that at your, uh, on, your, on your desk? I mean, anything you can tell us? Was there any allocation, new allocation, foreign allocation to India? What, what, uh, just some color, if you have, will help. So it's something which we are trying to attribute as well. And, and hindsight can be, and we can kind of come up with these answers. But, but quite frankly, it, it did take us by surprise, the, uh, the strength of India uh, in, a, in, a, in a kind of broader backdrop, which is, which is weak. Uh, now, apart from generic kind of comments about kind of rebalance flows, et cetera, um, we don't have much, 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 much more to kind of give you here. Um, so I think it, it was probably related to kind of rebound flows, but, but not much else. I mean, so at least we, we don't have a clear answer on that. Okay, just hold on for a bit. You know, we have uh, management joining us now. Aditya, I request you to even listen into that conversation and then perhaps give us uh, your views. Let's connect with Keki Mystery, who's the Vice Chairman and Chief Executive Officer at HDFC, to know his views on the hawkish comments from the Fed Chair and the overall business outlook. Mr. Mystery, good morning. Uh, you know, the first question is, could this tightening in the U.S. impact our economy as well? Uh, do you see the RBI continuing with rate hikes? And if yes, till when? I don't think tightening in the U.S. will have an impact on our economy directly. Indirectly, there might be some impact in terms of stock markets and valuations and currency and so on and so forth. Because whenever there is, historically, we've seen that whenever there is some event that happens in the U.S., like interest rates going up or, you know, many years ago, U.S. getting downgraded, whenever an event like that happens, money for some reason flows back to the U.S., so when money, equity money in particular flows back to the US, you could see a little bit of impact on the stock market, but not as much impact on India as you would see in other countries. Because a domestic market is so strong, we have seen so much of domestic investment coming into the equity markets that even though foreigners have withdrawn at one point of time nearly 35, 36 billion dollars, markets had not fallen that much. So Indian markets are far more resilient and the economy per se, I don't see the economy getting impacted in any uh, material kind of a manner. Interest rates, uh, will RBI raise rates, not raise rates? I, I, to my mind, I, I would still expect that there could be a 25, between a 25 and a 30, maybe at max, max a 35 basis points hike in rates in the next credit policy. Uh, Mr. Mistry, hi, good morning. Uh, India's housing sector is uh, looking up, right? Uh, and this is happening unlike what we're seeing in the US and China, where there are sharp slowdowns uh, which are taking place. Can we expect demand here to continue uh, to be pretty strong despite um, some of these un global uncertainties and uh, them weighing down here and showing up in India as well in the form of higher rates and other things? 
Well, first of all, I don't buy this theory of economic uncertainty. I think the economy is on extremely strong footing. I genuinely believe that. I genuinely see that in the economy. I talk to friends in different industries, and the optimism level that I've seen today is far higher than I've seen at almost any other time in the past. We have completely come out of COVID, so the economy stands on strong footing. That's number one. Number two, you talked of interest rates. See, you must, we must understand that a housing loan is a long-term loan. Initially, the original term of a loan would be could go up to 14 or 15 years, and the average term is typically 12 or 13 years, or that, that sort of a scheme. So in that period of 12 or 13 years, interest rates will go up and interest rates will come down. You can never have a steady interest rate environment. Uh, all loans offered today are by and large floating rate loans, but maybe a fixed tenor for a fixed term, fixed interest rate for one or two years. But otherwise, it's all floating rate. So when you are taking a 12-year or a 13-year loan, it really does not make so much difference where the interest rates are at the time when you take a loan. Because if rates are low, they will go higher over a period of time. If rates are high, they will get, go lower over a period of time. So it does not have that much impact on housing. Interest has a bigger impact on a shorter term uh, loan products like a personal loan or a, you know, a car loan or a consumer loan, where someone is taking a loan for say one year, two years, that type of thing. Because then if it's only a one year loan or a two year loan, it's very important that you borrow at a time when interest rates are low. So the momentum is strong, it continues to remain strong, and I remain extremely optimistic that the growth trajectory we have seen over the last couple of years will sustain for a very, very long time. Okay, uh, that point is taken, Mr. Mr. Good morning, but do you expect the, the fundraising to get more challenging or getting pricey going, going forward? I think fundraising is going to follow interest rates in the economy. So if interest rates in the economy rise, then fund, then obviously to that extent, the cost of raising money will also go up. But at the end of the day, all, ba all banks, all, all the bigger banks and we, for example, always carry a match balance sheet. So if funding cost goes up, then automatically the lending risk also goes up. So in a way, the spreads are always protected. And uh, I, I mean, as I mentioned earlier, in my opinion, RBI would look at probably a 25 to a 30, maybe a 35 basis points hike in rate in, in the next policy in September. But all this is so data dependent. It's, we are still, what, one and a half months or at least a month away from the credit policy. So in that period of one month, so many events are there. There will be the Fed policy, there'll be inflation data, there'll be so many other indicators which would give a better sense of where inflation is and where the current account uh, situation is to help, you know, to, to sort of uh, uh, pro help RBI take the decision on whether to raise rates and if so, by how much. Okay. The spreads were significantly under pressure in Q1. How do your spreads normalize in the coming quarters? So we had explained very clearly after the results why you saw that the net interest income or the net interest margin was slightly lower. Net interest margin was within the band in which it historically has been. In fact, it was a little higher than the earlier band. It's just that the previous year, the first quarter of last year, which is April, May, June of 2021, the net interest margin had been extremely high for certain events which had happened at that time, which I explained after the results. Now, I'd also explain that another reason for the net interest mark, the net interest income growth to be slightly lower than the normal growth that we see is because of the fact that whilst on the on the on the on the asset side, the loans that we give to individual customers, the repricing of the loan happens every three months. So if someone has taken a loan, let's say in the month of January, then his loan would get repriced in January, April, July, October, and, uh, and, and January. If someone has taken a loan in February, it will be three months from February. Whereas on the borrowing side, that rate change is immediate. So when rates go up, temporarily you see for a month or so that the benefit, the higher uh, lending rates or the increase on the asset side will come over a period of three months. So there's typically a one month lag between the time the interest rates are adjusted and the customer starts paying the higher rate on individual loans. On non-individual loans, the effect is... Uh, like any other, it's immediate. Mr. Mistry, what's your view on the corporate book? Uh, when can we see a pickup in the corporate book? Uh, and also, when do you see 
Uh, how do you see wholesale real estate uh, loan demand this year in F523? It's been muted in the recent past. So the reason why you see that the non-individual loan book growth has been lower than earlier years primarily results out of the fact that between 2017 and 2020, uh, real, the real estate sector, particularly in the metros, was under a little bit of pressure. We all know that. Uh, after 2020, the demand has picked up significantly. Markets have been growing very rapidly and so on and so forth. Now, between 2017 and 2020, a uh, launch of new projects had slowed down significantly. And a construction finance project, unlike, a, let's say, a corporate loan or a lease rental discounting loan, uh, in a corporate loan or an LRD loan, the disbursement is made immediately. So if you give a loan of, let's say, argument's sake, 100 crores to a customer, that 100 crores can get dispersed very, very quickly. Whereas in a construction finance loan, the disbursement is spread over a period of construction. So the builder puts in his equity first and then the, the disbursement starts. So the pickups, so whilst the demand has started picking up in the last couple of years, by the time it starts getting reflected in a big way in the loan book, it could still take a few couple of quarters. Because as I said, the disbursement is spread over the uh, construction period. The construction period can sometimes go for three years, four years. So it's spread over that period of time. Okay, Mr. Nasti, thanks a lot for, for joining us. Good talking to you to as, uh, uh, as always. Uh, that's HDFC. Uh, uh, well, uh, uh, Aditya Suresh is uh, still with us from Macquarie. Uh, 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 Aditya, uh, you know, you would have heard Mr. Mistri. I wonder your thoughts in general on the on the financials because that's one space which is clearly outperforming. I mean, except for the HDFC uh, twins, uh, which have had their own issues. But uh, X of that, uh, you know, whether it's Bajaj twins or ICICI Bank, X is uh, they sort of uh, led the rally. Uh, your views? So for us, financials is the key overweight. Uh, I think, quite frankly, this is a bit of a consensus position. Uh, but if you think about kind of where the, the path forward is from an earnings perspective, uh, in a, a, a kind of framing this in a broader kind of India context as well, uh, financials is, is one area where I think you are fairly confident, uh, at least we're fairly confident that, that you'll get some fairly good uh, growth kind of coming through, right? And um, partly this is optics, yes, but, 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 but a lot of this is also about uh, kind of uh, at least we're, we're optimistic about kind of credit kind of picking up uh, in the system over the next couple of couple of years. So in terms of confidence of earnings, the state of the balance sheets, uh, as, as well as kind of some of these provision ratios, uh, it, it looks like some of the best environments are, are numbers which we've seen, right? So I think financials does genuinely stand out here for us in a broader India setup. And that's that remains a, uh, the key overweight from a kind of um, sectoral pers uh, perspective. Okay. Uh, would that also include some of the NBFCs? Because, for example, the Bajaj twins have done exceptionally mm -hmm. well. And a lot of financers, you know, especially auto financers, have been doing well because of the rising demand. Um, how are you approaching that space? We are more positioned in the large cap, uh, large cap banks uh, than the NBFCs. Uh, so our preference is uh, for the likes of HJC Bank, ICICI, SPI, th those type of companies. Within the NBFCs, uh, SPI card is something which we still like. Okay, I'll just <coughs> stay on. We have a couple of more questions for you. But for now, we need to take a break. Once we come back, uh, we'll have uh, our technical experts also joining us. It's weekly expiry day. So, Sudarshan Sukhani and Mitesh Thakkar will be with us. Welcome back. Uh, well, that's the SGX Nifty. If you think 31 points is all that you have to negotiate, uh, you're mistaken because you know the market was not trading yesterday and it was down about 300 points uh, on the SGX yesterday. So technically, it's indicating a 330 point downtick. Whether that happens or not, and whether that gets bought, uh, let's ask our experts. So we have Sudarshan Sukhani and Mitesh Thakkar joining us. Gentlemen, good morning. Uh, uh, Sudarshan, this market teaches something new every day, right? I mean, uh, on Tuesday, we had this massive rally. Uh, nobody could have thought about, you know, uh, even trying to short. Uh, and this morning, if the S6 Nifty is right, we are staring at a 300-point gap down. Uh, what do you do uh, if, if, if we indeed get that kind of a gap down? Yeah, good morning, Anwish. You are quite right. On Tuesday, although we had said that we will go long, whatever it takes, and we will keep it on a day-to-day -day basis. 
So that was the day, and when it ended, the trade also ended. That day-to-day -day basis theme continues. There is no sense in carrying a position forward because we have no idea what the trend is and how markets will behave on the next day. Only when we get a trend, we try to carry forward positions, and there is no such trend. Now, after a 350 or 340 point decline, it's very difficult to say that we want to short here. So the trade is still to see if the markets stabilize in the morning. If they stabilize, keep a stop loss below the low of the day till then and try to go long in this market. Don't carry a position. If you get stopped out, just forget about it. There is a line in the sand or rather there is a Lakshman Rekha which is about 17,150. That's the point at which the markets bounce back on Monday. So till that level holds, I would be uh, looking to buy the dips. Once that level is broken, the theme changes. Hmm. Okay. okay, sorry. All right. Uh, Mitesh Thakkar is also with us. Mitesh, good morning. How do you feel about the markets now, considering that you know it's been one up day, one down day, but largely India has been resilient compared to global peers. You think the dips should still get bought? Good morning. Uh, my belief is yes. I think very clearly this is a market, you know, which I think is in a medium to long trend. Now, what happened was in the, the last few days was that we had had a rally from 15,100, one of the three levels, about 18,000 levels, and then we gave a part of the rally. So I think we're still in that process of consolidation where the markets will chop around a bit. But I think broadly, uh, after a couple of days of consolidation, I think this market should break on the upside and get into, you know, uh, testing at least earlier highs, if not making new highs immediately. So I'm, I'm clearly positively biased. I, again, you know, suspect we'll open uh, the way the SCX is indicating. But yet, I think, you know, even if it does that, I think that will be an immediate buying opportunity. On the upside uh, for the Nifty for me, I think 17,880, 17,965, uh, sorry, uh, uh, are, are the levels to watch out and I think you know we will eventually hit those levels in the next couple of days. So that's the idea and around 17400, 430 which is the 20 day average plus the previous uh, so pivot support on the hourly chart. I think that that area should possibly see a good throwback. So if you open on that area I think that will be buying opportunity early in the morning. Okay uh, on the bank nifty sorry Mitesh uh, what would be the levels to yeah. watch? On which bank nifty the key support on the medium term chart is 37,500 but the immediate support is around 38,000, 38,050 levels. So, uh, I don't know how it opens but I think around 38,000, 38,050 levels if it opens and doesn't see any follow through, I think that will again be a buying signal. For me. Okay, so buy signal is something that you should look at. That's the consensus view. But in terms of stocks then, uh, Mitesh, what are you going with? Uh, uh, on the stock side, I have a mix of buys and sells. Uh, Two buys and two sells. Uh, on the buying side is Colgate. It had a very strong weekly candle. If you look at the last week's, uh, I mean, if you, if you if you look at the current week's uh, ongoing candle, uh, so any dip would be buying a opportunity around sixteen fifty five. Buy with a stop below sixteen thirty for targets of seventeen ten. Uh, Apollo Tires is a buy with a stop at two forty six for targets of two sixty two. I have two sell calls as well, but again, as I said, I think you know that will be determined after the market opening. If we see follow through, then we'll take some shots. But Granules is a sell with a stop at three one one. For targets of 295 and emphasis is a sell with a stop at 2157 for targets of 2017. And Sudarshan, how about you? Well, I have some buying ideas mainly and one intraday short, but the levels are going to be very different. So I won't discuss the stop losses. I'll just discuss the themes. The first buying idea is Bajaj Auto. Bajaj Auto has been a very resilient performer and I think that should continue. The second is DLF. It's outperforming the broad nifty and the chances are that dips are buying opportunities there. Ipka Lab is the only intraday short sell. Again, you have to see the levels, but the primary theme is to look to buy after this 350 point dip and the final buy is ICICI Bank. Now, the idea is to wait patiently for the first 45 minutes, one hour. Whenever you see a sense of stability, then go and buy. Don't ru just rush into the open. All right, uh, the gentlemen, thanks both of you for joining us and running us uh, through what you make of things and I mean, important perspective as well from a technical trading setup point of view. We'll take a very quick break here. We are back. The pre-open session, of course, uh, when we return, we'll have uh, Srihas uh, Tambe, Deputy CEO at Biocon Biologics, to talk about the observations made by the US FDA, each for its two sites in Bengaluru and six for the Malaysia sites. We'll uh, also, in a bit, after that, connect with Vandana Hari of Vanda Insights to discuss the outlook on oil. I mean, oil went up $10. It's come down $10, all in a matter of a week and a half. We are back with all of that in just a bit.
Your health is our concern.